Ron Dennis found the budget, John Barnard drew the box, and Hans Mesger filled it. The result was a 1.5-liter twin turbo V6 that married carbon monotony with calibrated fury. It didn't roar. It reasoned. Bosch logic trimming fuel. Kuhnle Kopp and Kausch turbos, feeding a narrow chamber burn that made speed without waste. In a championship decided by heat, fuel, and reliability, the TTEP-01 turned restraint into a weapon. How Tag and McLaren pulled Porsche into Formula One. Ron Dennis needed a power unit tailored to a carbon fiber vision, not a compromise grafted onto it. Porsche had the know-how, but not the appetite to self-fund an all-new Grand Prix engine. The solution was a three-way pact. McLaren's leadership, Porsche's engineering, and Tag's checkbook. Mansour Oja agreed to bankroll a bespoke turbo program on one condition. The engines would carry Tag's name. A design contract followed, and work began in late 1981. At Weissach, Hans Mesger took the brief and worked directly with John Barnard. Porsche's history pointed to a flat six, but Barnard's packaging limits and underbody airflow targets killed that idea early. The unit had to be narrow across the crankcase, with water and oil pumps pushed to the front to clear the diffuser channels and preserve McLaren's inswept bodywork ahead of the rear wheels. Out went the idea of a broad boxer. In came a compact V architecture that respected the chassis envelope. The answer settled as an 80-degree V6 of just 1.5 liters. A bore and stroke of 82 by 47.3 millimeters gave rev potential, while a tight valve angle formed a compact chamber that resisted knock at high boost. Kuhnle Kopp and Kausch turbos handled the forced induction, chosen for dependable response and ideal packaging. Even the exhaust updraft and mirror image turbo orientation were tuned to suit Barnard's arrow rather than force it to compromise. Control was the other pillar. Early running used mechanical injection, but the project quickly embraced Bosch electronic management, Metronic MP 1.7 in the racing application, bringing sequential fuel delivery and disciplined spark to an era that punished thirst and heat. In the garage, it meant repeatability. On track, it meant you could finish at the pace you started. By the end of 1983, the prototype had raced, and the intent was unmistakable. A small, tightly managed V6 that fit the car, respected the fuel cap, and put McLaren back on the front foot. The break with tradition was not a flourish, it was a requirement. The turbo era rewarded bravado with boost, but the championship would be won by a compact idea perfectly placed. McLaren had its engine, Porsche had its purpose. Barnard versus Mesger. Packaging, a turbo era weapon. McLaren's edge with the tag program began before dyno sheets. It began when John Barnard drew a strict chassis envelope and asked Hans Mesger to fit the power unit inside it, rather than force compromises around it. Barnard demanded a narrow engine bay to protect underfloor flow and his inswept body sides, which meant compact packaging and relocation of ancillaries from the outset. A wide boxer was rejected because the diffuser and side pod tunnels needed that width for airflow. The configuration that satisfied both camps was an 80-degree V6 chosen to keep the crankcase slim while meeting turbo-era hardware demands. To preserve the aerodynamic profile, the water and oil pumps were moved to the front of the engine rather than hung on the sides, and the exhausts were given an updraft to clear the rear bodywork. The twin Kuhnle Kopp and Kausch turbos were installed in the side pod frontal areas to suit the MP4-2's shape. By mid-1985, mirror image units were supplied, so both banks could run neatly symmetric plumbing. Barnard's wind tunnel discipline underpinned these choices. With the tag-badged unit, he could dictate key component locations from the outset, achieving installation harmony that echoed classic DFV-era integration. When ground effect disappeared and flat bottoms arrived for 1983, the engine had more room than the initial sketches assumed, yet the narrow architecture stayed because the car still needed it to keep the floor working. The hard numbers supported the package. Bore and stroke measured 82 by 47.3 millimeters, allowing high RPM without punitive piston speed, and the valve angle was kept tight at about 30 degrees to create a compact chamber tolerant of boost and ignition demands. Paired Kuhnle Kopp and Kausch turbos, oriented for the bodywork, completed a unit that worked with the chassis rather than bullying it. This was not a victory of chassis over engine, but a negotiated weapon. Mesger gained robust turbo mountings, cooling path flexibility, 
and service access mechanics could live with. Barnard preserved his silhouette, protected the diffuser, and kept the side pods clean. Out of that handshake came the TTEP 01's defining trait, authority through packaging. McLaren and Porsche did not ask the car to carry the engine. They built an engine to serve the car, and that decision paid out, lap after lap. Inside the TTEP-01, compact violence, architecture, and combustion, Mesger's brief crystallized into a small, disciplined engine that served Barnard's chassis. The configuration fixed early, a 1.5-liter, 80-degree V6, narrow across the crankcase to protect underfloor flow and in-swept side bodywork. Barnard's envelope also forced an unusual service layout. Water and oil pumps went to the front of the block instead of the sides, and the exhausts left with a deliberate updraft to clear the diffuser zone. Core geometry followed function. Bore and stroke sat at 82 by 47.3 millimeters, a rev-friendly ratio that curbed mean piston speed while leaving room for the valve gear Porsche wanted. The chamber itself was tight and knock-resistant, with a narrow included valve angle around 30 degrees to minimize surface area at the kind of boost the era demanded. Turbocharging came from German specialist Kuhnle Kopp and Kausch Turbos. Placement was dictated by the car, not convenience. Both turbochargers sat within the frontal areas of the side pods to preserve body shaping, with an updraft manifold feeding them. Mid-1985, mirror image units were delivered so each bank could run cleaner, shorter gas and air paths, small plumbing gains that mattered when every millisecond of response was currency. Control finished the picture. Early tests used mechanical systems, but the race engine moved to Bosch's all-electronic management, Matronic MP 1.7 in the Formula One application, bringing sequential fuel delivery and disciplined spark. It wasn't a marketing flourish. It was the difference between chasing a setup and reproducing one. Hot lap to stint to race day. Bosch's own matrix lists. MP 1.7 against Tag Porsche F1, underlining the tie-up. The Grand Prix engine's notes described the tailored Porsche EMS and why it mattered once the 220-liter fuel cap arrived for 1984. When the prototype appeared late in 1983, revs were capped near 11,800 RPM for reliability and roughly 715 horsepower in race trim, a starting point rather than a ceiling. The architecture proved elastic. By 1984, the same hard point supported higher boost on McLaren's MP4-2, and the development path eventually carried qualifying figures near four digits before the sport's evolving limits pulled boost back. What never changed was the engine's character, a compact, knock-resistant chamber, short, symmetric turbo plumbing, ancillaries moved for aero, and an ECU that made the whole behave like a single, coherent idea. The result wasn't merely small and powerful, it was an ecosystem, geometry that welcomed boost, combustion that tolerated it, plumbing that served the body, and electronics that kept the promise repeatable. In a decade that rewarded excess, the TTEP-01's advantage came from discipline baked into its dimensions. Brains and thirst, Bosch Matronic, boost, and fuel limit racing. Turbo power was only half the equation. The other half was discipline. Porsche's tag-badged V6, was paired with Bosch's all-electronic engine management, Motronic MP 1.7, bringing sequential fuel injection and tightly controlled spark to a formula that punished waste and heat. Bosch's own roster lists MP 1.7, TAG, Porsche F1, alongside other contemporary Formula One and Indy units, underlining how central that ECU became to the package. From 1984, the rules forced the issue. Total race fuel was capped at 220 liters, with in-race refueling banned. Teams could qualify at full ferocity, but the Grand Prix distance became an economy trial as much as a sprint. Matronic's precision helped Porsche and McLaren live within that ration, and Bosch's custom EMS for the P01 even accounted for fuel temperature, useful when crews chilled the fuel to increase density before the 1985 ban on pre-cooling. Electronics did more than meter fuel, they informed the driver. In 1985, the system added a fuel flow and remaining fuel display so the driver could pace to the line, an advantage rivals lacked at the time. The strategy curve sharpened again in 1986 when the allocation fell to 195 liters, 
McLaren's season revealed how unforgiving the math could be if readings went astray. As fuel fell, boost limits arrived. For 1987, the FIA added a pop-off valve to cap pressure at 4 bar, then tightened it to 2.5 bar for 1988, transforming how teams shaped power and response. The MP4-3 documentation spells out the practical headaches. Each bank's tall plenum needed its own FIA pop-off valve, and when set points misbehaved, power vanished. McLaren learned to run under the headline limit, about 3.6 bar, trading peak numbers for predictable delivery and better economy. Within that box, Matronic MP 1.7 became the quiet weapon. Compared with older electronic mechanical systems, its fully electronic control and solenoid injectors gave repeatability from dyno to race, and Bosch's development brought it a point by the first race of 1984, which McLaren won. The upshot was simple. The car left the pits with a target. The ECU enforced the plan, and the driver could spend his margin on tires and traffic rather than second-guessing consumption. By late 1987, the tag Porsche was no longer the headline brute for raw boost. Its edge was calibration, economy, and drivability. It kept banking points, while rivals tripped over pop-off valve limits and fuel targets. The rulebook tells the story. 220 liters of fuel in 1984 and 85, cut to 195 liters in 1986, with a boost cap of 4 bar in 1987, and then 2.5 bar in 1988. The team that turned those lines into lap time would own the era, and McLaren, Porsche, and Bosch did exactly that, with Bosch Matronic MP 1.7 as the nervous system holding it together. 1984 to 1985, the win machine. McLaren did not just arrive with the tag Porsche, it arrived with a package that turned Grand Prix distance into controlled demolition. The MP4-2 set the tone for 1984, fast when it needed to be, and far more reliable than anything that tried to match its pace. Sundays became lopsided, 4-1-2 finishes, frequent races with only the McLarens on the lead lap, and a title fight that felt settled long before the finale. Under the skin, the MP4-2 was an integrated answer to the fuel-limited turbo era, a carbon monocoque, tidy packaging, and a Porsche V6, refined by relentless late-season mileage after its debut in 1983. The monocoque was rebuilt to host a larger fuel cell, the side pods curled in around forward-set turbo hardware, and the test program was so exhaustive that Niki Lauda raced the same chassis all year. Twelve wins from sixteen starts told the rest of the story, capped by Lauda's title over Alain Prost by half a point at the season's end. In 1985, the opposition sharpened, but McLaren refined. The B evolution cleaned the bodywork, a tire switch from Michelin to Goodyear changed the car's feel, and Porsche found more power while trimming consumption. Contemporary figures quoted roughly 850 horsepower in race trim and as much as 960 for qualifying, enough to control grids even when others grabbed the odd pole. Alain Prost converted that consistency into his first world title with five wins, and the team completed back-to-back -back constructors' crowns. Across these two seasons, the pattern held. The tag Porsche was not always the wildest number on a dyno sheet, yet it coupled usable power with mileage and a chassis that stayed kind to tires and brakes through long, fast corners. Circuits like Sandvoort and the Oosterreichring rewarded that blend. The score lines from those years read like a verdict. It was ruthless efficiency, not headline boost numbers alone. When the checkered flag fell, McLaren's points were the proof. 1986 to 1987, caps, lag, and the closing walls. The landscape tightened in 1986. With total race fuel reduced again, the car's balance sheet changed from how much power to how much power you could keep using. Porsche's response wasn't a louder dyno sweep. It was a quieter kind of progress. Heat management in the charge path calmer, transient behavior from the twin Kuhnle Kopp and Kausch turbos, and calibration that let the driver ask for acceleration without triggering a fuel penalty every time the throttle snapped open. Turbo lag became the daily tax. Big peak numbers were easy. Repeatable response was not. Porsche trimmed plumbing length wherever the chassis allowed, leaned on the mirror image units to keep left and right banks symmetric, and worked the wastegate strategy so boost climbed in a managed ramp instead of a cliff. The aim was to land the engine in its efficient island and hold it there through long corners and traffic, 
rather than chasing a surge that overheated the intercoolers and drove up consumption. Hardware followed the same logic. Compressor and turbine choices edged toward quicker spin-up, and the updraft manifolds that had made packaging sense now doubled as a way to keep heat out of the floor. In the garage, crews found margin in small things, sealing, insulation, and ensuring that sensor readings for fuel and boost matched what the driver felt. The race was no longer full push, it was full plan. Then came 1987 and the pop-off valve. The cap did more than limit peak pressure, it changed how the engine breathed. Each bank's tall plenum wanted its own valve, and if either one misbehaved, the driver paid with a clean cut in thrust. McLaren learned to live just under the nominal limit, so the valves stayed quiet, giving a usable slope of power instead of a noisy sawtooth. The net effect looked conservative on paper and felt faster on Sunday. Within those walls, the tag Porsche kept scoring. It wasn't the paddock's wild animal anymore. It was the dependable tool that delivered the lap time you could plan for. Smaller steps in hardware, sharper steps in control, and a willingness to leave a little headroom turned regulation into rhythm. While others fought the cap, the V6 learned to breathe inside it, and the points kept coming. What tag Porsche changed? The TTEP-01 did more than power a winning car. It changed how teams thought about engines. The first lesson was packaging as performance. By shaping a compact 80-degree V6 to serve John Barnard's airflow, Porsche showed that lap time grows when the chassis gets space. Water and oil pumps moved forward, exhausts swept upward, and side pod volumes stayed clean. The engine bay became an aerodynamic asset. The second lesson was control over spectacle. With fuel caps and heat deciding races, the Kuhnle Kopp and Kausch turbochargers only made sense when their violence was rationed. Bosch Matronic MP 1.7 did the rationing, injector timing, and spark aligned, so the car left the pits with a consumption target and hit it. It looked conservative, yet it won the kind of Sundays that mattered. Third came serviceability. Porsche and McLaren demanded an installation that could be built, cooled, and repaired inside a tight calendar. Mirror image units shortened plumbing and simplified routing. Symmetric layouts cleaned sensor logic. Access points were chosen for mechanics, not brochure photos. The V6 looked small because every millimeter did more than one job. Aftermath arrived in two planes. Near term, rivals copied the priorities. Narrow engines, stricter fuel management, and electronics lead calibration. Long term, the project nudged Porsche's identity away from reflexive boxer thinking not a rejection, but proof the company could win with any architecture the brief required. It also validated Ron Dennis's model of a funded, named partner, delivering to a chassis-led brief, a template others later emulated. What changed, finally, was confidence. Tag Porsche taught the paddock a turbo engine could be civil, repeatable, and truly useful over a Grand Prix distance. Sport remembered the thunder. The stopwatch remembered the plan. History remembers noise, but championships reward discipline. Tag Porsche's TTEP-01 proved that a compact, rigorously managed V6 could turn fuel limits, heat, and packaging into lap time. It fit the McLaren like a structural member, let Bosch Matronic police every heartbeat, and made restraint feel ruthless. In an age drunk on boost, this engine stayed sober and won. If you want more machines that rewrote Formula One's rulebook from the inside out, stay with Norang. We'll keep opening the cases, measuring the parts, and telling the truths the spec sheets can't.